Welcome to Beer and Iron's Easy Baked Chicken and Beer Rice Recipe Cooked in a Camp Cast Iron Dutch Oven. This recipe was featured on the video, How to Heat the Camp Cast Iron Dutch Oven. This is the recipe most of you guys have been asking for. I'm going to present this recipe by pre-preparing many of the ingredients at home before leaving for camp. I'm heading out to one of our local state parks for an evening of simmering and scenery. We're going to break this recipe down into three sections. Preparing our ingredients before leaving for camp or on the day trip. Preparing some of the ingredients right there in camp or the picnic area. And we're going to go through the steps to cook our meal from fire to plate. Let's prepare our ingredients at home. You can prepare the ingredients right there in camp if you like. This recipe can be created either with chicken breast or chicken thighs. I'm going to present it by using bone-in and skin-on chicken thighs. Boneless and skinless thighs are A-OK -okay too. I'm going to show you how to pre-prepare each of these choices. But first, the brine. I always brine my chicken meat before I pack it up for camp. We brine chicken thighs for about two to three hours. We usually brine at room temperature, but you can brine in the refrigerator as well. Chicken breast, because we're going to be tenderizing that chicken breast meat, should only be brined for about an hour. So why do we brine? We want that beer brine to flavor that chicken deep into the meat, not only to make it salty, but also for flavor. I usually don't add salt to this recipe because I have a flavorful beer brine meat and a vegetable and rice mixture that is salted by the cream of chicken and the cream of mushroom soups. Sometimes I'll add a bit of pepper, but that's up to you. To create the beer brine, remember this ratio. 12 ounces of beer to one tablespoon of salt. We're gonna be using two cans of beer and two tablespoons of salt. Use a nice mild beer. A lager works well. I prefer craft beer, but for example purposes, I'm using a Modelo. Most will be able to identify how a Modelo tastes. Try to select a beer similar to the mildness of Modelo. Avoid IPAs for this brine. If you're using chicken breast, you're going to need about three or four chicken breasts that we're going to cut in half after we tenderize and brine the chicken. To learn more about how I tenderize and brine chicken breast, follow the link in the description. If you need to, trim your chicken breast meat. Do you see how thick that chicken breast meat is? Start with the needle tenderizer. Work from thin to thick. Then work the meat with the meat tenderizing mallet. The breast meat is now tenderized and almost consistent in thickness. It's gonna cook evenly. Cut the chicken breast perpendicular. You'll have about two equal sized pieces from each chicken breast that are about the size of the palm of your hand. Brine the chicken breast only for an hour. You'll only need an hour because you've tenderized it and opened up that breast meat to receive that brine. Once your chicken breasts are tenderized and have been in the brine for about an hour, remove the chicken from the brine and pat dry with a paper towel. Then pour the brine out of the zipper bag and place a few dry paper towels in the same zipper bag. Place the six to eight halves of chicken breast in the bag with the paper towels and zip up the bag. Refrigerate this until you're ready to create this recipe. If you're using skinless and boneless chicken thighs, you're going to need a bunch of them. You're going to need about 6 to 12 boneless and skinless chicken thighs for this recipe. They're usually smaller and you're going to need more of them. And they tend to sink during the baking process. I'll explain later. We don't tenderize our chicken thighs. Chicken thighs tend to be a bit fatty and sometimes still have little bone pieces left on them. We trim a bit of that fat off. Fat is the river for which flavor flows, but we don't want that river flooding. Fat ain't like money. More ain't always better. These chicken thighs are not tenderized and will do well in that brine for two to three hours. After two to three hours, remove the chicken thighs from the brine and onto a rack or cutting board to pat dry with a few paper towels. After pouring out the brine from the zipper bag, place a few dry paper towels in the bag and store the chicken thighs in that same bag and in the refrigerator or ice chest until you're ready to cook. I'm gonna present this recipe using chicken thighs, skin on and bone in. This is my choice for creating this recipe. 
Like with the boneless and skinless chicken thighs, you'll need to do a bit of trimming on these to keep the dish from becoming too oily or too fatty. My suggestion with each meat choice is to prepare just a few more than you think you'll need. You'll inevitably drop one in the dirt or have room for just one more piece in that pot. These chicken thighs are not tenderized and they're gonna do just fine in that brine for two or three hours. After the chicken thighs have been in the brine for two or three hours, remove the chicken thighs from the brine and onto some sort of cutting board or drying rack. Pat them dry with a few paper towels and then after emptying that bag of the brine, place a few dry paper towels in the bag and store the chicken thighs in that same bag in the refrigerator or ice chest until you're ready to cook. Let's pre-prepare the remaining ingredients. Now we have either the chicken breast and chicken thighs ready to go. We're gonna get the rest of the ingredients ready. First, we're gonna mince up three to six cloves of garlic and one whole onion. We're gonna chop it. We're gonna store the garlic and the onions in the same zipper bag. A bit of a tip here, use a canning funnel to guide the cut ingredients into the storage containers. I suggest double bagging the garlic and onions in the same container. Chop one green bell pepper. You could use a couple or three Anaheim peppers here if you like. A note on the bell pepper. Depending on how large you cut those pieces of bell pepper and how long you saute the pepper later in the cook will make the difference in the bell pepper's final consistency. I love a bit of crunch to my cooked bell pepper. I find the flavor to be more distinct. Consider the chop sizes and how long you're gonna saute that bell pepper for your personal texture and flavor preferences. Now dice up the three stalks of celery. Yes, celery goes well with this dish. Just strip them lengthwise and chop them small into diced pieces. Are you enjoying this video thus far? Consider giving us a thumbs up, hitting that little subscribe button, and don't forget to hit that little dinner bell. Next, measure out two cups of white rice and store in a container to make it ready for cooking time. Now gather together the remaining ingredients. A bottle of Worcestershire sauce, 10 ounce can of a cream of mushroom soup, and a 10 ounce can of a cream of chicken soup. Do you need a can opener? Pack it now, trust me. You're gonna forget to bring something, but don't forget the can opener. You're gonna need two to three tablespoons of cornstarch and likely more. I just bring the whole container. An eight ounce container of sour cream. It's more expensive per ounce, but having a pre-packaged eight ounce container is so much easier when in camp. Some poultry seasoning. We're gonna need about a tablespoon, give or take. I just bring the whole bottle. Don't forget to bring the salt and pepper. We're also gonna need our beer two 12 ounce cans or bottles of beer. You'll need anywhere from 20 to 24 ounces. Just leave these two beers out and at room temperature. We'll be adding them to a hot pot. A container of oil for pan frying the chicken. A high heat variety is best. Okay y'all, off to camp. Like I said, I always forget something when I'm out and about. You will too. Sometimes you'll need to improvise. Forgetting your Dutch oven may be a deal killer, but you can cook all the live long day if you forget a cutting board. Do what you can with what you've got. It's all going to be okay. We're going to sear or fry our chicken, and then we're going to bake this dish. You're going to need at least 24 briquettes for baking. Prepare more than you're going to need. We're really going to need a very hot pot to initially sear or fry that chicken. Pull out and organize all of your ingredients. Don't leave anything in that ice chest. You'll likely forget it in there. Now I have my pre-prepared chicken at the ready, but doggone it if we didn't go off and forget the cutting board. My wife always keeps sanitizing wipes in the car and I cleaned off my Dutch oven supply box. That lid works great as a prep table. 
The first part of this recipe is to sear or brown our chicken meat. As the briquettes are heating up, prepare your chicken for that hot pot. We already have the backsides of our chicken prepped with poultry seasoning and cornstarch. I'll flip them over and show you how I do this. First, a light dusting of poultry seasoning, and then add some cornstarch. Just knock a bit of that cornstarch on each piece of that chicken. Then rub it in and knock off the excess. Now, ready for the hot pot. I keep a bucket of clean water nearby for washing my hands off, but it also works great for the potential fire mishap and also to drown my fire at the end and before I leave camp. That sun is coming through bright this evening. Dump out all your briquettes onto that cooking surface. Though I'm in a fire pit, I need something to hold up the Dutch oven from sinking into the ash or the dirt. My upside down garbage can lid works great. There's more than 40 briquettes down there. That's a lot of heat. We're going to need it to fry and saute, but we will need much less when we bake this dish. I don't usually drop a cool pot right onto a hot bed of fire like that. I often have to talk my pot into getting into that fire by preheating the pot first. I'll drop that grate down and set that pot above that hot fire for a bit before setting it right onto those hot coals. Notice I have a 10 inch Kemp cast iron Dutch oven near that fire pit. I will use that pot as my warming pot. There's gonna be some time between searing that chicken and sauteing the vegetables. We need to keep the chicken warm and away from the flies and other possibilities with an off-leash dog being one of those possibilities. Our pot is warmed and ready for that fire. That sunlight is coming and going. I'll do my best to block the light for y'all while I cook. Add just a bit of oil to the pot. Rare does a pot sit flat on the ground, and that's okay. I like having a bit of oil reservoir as I cook. You'll see why as I cook. If your oil is migrated to one side, just wipe the chicken through the oil and then back up to high ground as you sear. We'll drag it back through a couple of times to keep it greased. Only sear half of the chicken at a time. Sear both sides of the chicken, but only half of the chicken pieces at a time. That cold chicken is gonna try to cool that pot while that pot tries to sear that chicken. Too much chicken will overwhelm the pot and the broth will flow. You'll end up with boiled chicken. Fear not, we have a warming pot at the ready. Yes sir and yes ma'am, this is what you're looking for right here. You are looking for flavor and a golden brown color. You're not looking for doneness. That chicken is not fully cooked yet. No sampling. Set the seared chicken over into the warming pot. A paper towel in that pot will soak up the excess oil. The paper towel is optional. That chicken's gonna make a bit of broth as it rests in that pot, and you could use that broth in this recipe. Now I add the second batch of chicken to the hot pot. Now you see how I keep that chicken up on the high ground, right? After your second batch is done, wipe out any excess oil from the pot with a paper towel. This is really not much oil and would work perfectly. Nonetheless, I'll show you what I mean by wiping the excess oil. Save that oily paper towel. It makes a great fire starter. Add the onions and garlic to the pot and saute until translucent and you've deglazed that pot. Now add the chopped green bell pepper and the diced celery. Stir it all about for a minute or two. It is at this point where you can control the consistency of your bell pepper. Saute for longer if you like softer bell peppers. Now add your rice and mix in well. At this point, I suggest you pull that pot from the heat for a quick moment and add the rest of the ingredients. Add the beer to the pot. You can start with just 20 ounces if you like and test for doneness later, or you can just add both cans. There'll be some evaporation, and then again, those vegetables and that chicken will make some moisture as well. Add the sour cream to the pot. Then add the cream of mushroom soup. Then add the cream of chicken soup. You'll need about a tablespoon of Worcestershire sauce. I don't measure. I just dab, dab, dab it in. Yep, that's a bit more than a tablespoon. Just add your Worcestershire sauce to taste. Mix everything in well. Pay attention though to that sour cream. It'll take a bit of doing to get that sour cream mixed in real well. 
Make sure there's no grains of rice stuck to the side of that Dutch oven wall. Any grains of rice outside the liquid will not cook. Before you add the chicken, taste the mixture in the pot. Do you need any salt and pepper? Add some if you do. Now back on the fire. We'll be baking this dish now at a gold temperature of 350 degrees Fahrenheit or 175 degrees Celsius. We have a 12 inch Kemp cast iron Dutch oven and you're gonna need 24 briquettes. 12 times two. 24 briquettes divided by three is eight briquettes. Put eight or nine briquettes at the bottom and the rest, 16 to 17 briquettes on the top. We may use more briquettes here because those briquettes are burned down a little bit but nowhere near spent. Set the pot over the eight to nine briquettes and then add the chicken to the top of the dish. The skin on and bone in chicken thighs are large enough and they'll usually float in a manner of speaking. So will the chicken breast. If you're using skinless boneless chicken thighs, they'll usually sink, but don't fret if they sink, it's a-okay. Return the lid to the pot and top it with 16 to 17 hot briquettes. Now we wait for the magic of the black pot. You see there to the left at my little fajita skillet? Yep, hot food does well on a hot plate. About every 10 minutes or so, give the pot and lid a turn. Turn the lid one third of a turn in one direction, and then turn the whole pot one third of a turn in the other direction. Time for a beer. How do we know when our food is done? If the rice is done, then the dish is done. The rice is the telltale. If there's any undone rice, it's gonna be at the top. Scoop out a bit with a fork or a spoon. Is it done? If not, keep cooking if the rice needs more time. Checking the chicken's temperature is easy. Once the chicken is 165 degrees Fahrenheit or 75 degrees Celsius, it's ready. But is the rice completely cooked? I'd focus on the texture of the rice. When the rice is ready, the dish is usually ready. But do check the temperature of the chicken. Now it's time to eat. Remember that heating fajita skillet? It makes a great plate. Get that Dutch oven off the fire. Set the rest of that beer down, give a bit of thanks to the good Lord, and start chowing down. I appreciate each and every one of y'all for watching this video. If you've liked what you've seen and want to see more, give us a bit of a thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button, and don't forget to hit that little dinner bell. We're going to enjoy the rest of our evening here in the great big wide world. You all keep cooking in those black beauties and enjoying those frosted glasses of that fermented barley pop. We'll see you next time on BeerAndIron.com.